Dear ESF friends, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all have had a great start to the new year. I am pleased today to welcome you to our two-part webinar series on a very topical subject, culture in the time of COVID, organized in partnership with the Asia Europe Foundation, ASEF. The pandemic continues to bring many uncertainties and challenges in our day-to-day -day lives. In this respect, it has driven us to reflect on how we perform some of our daily actions and enables us to reevaluate the normal operating procedures that we had become accustomed to. Culture. Culture makes up the social fabric in all parts of the world. It contributes to many facets, including education, economics, and diplomacy. In today's webinar, we engage in insightful conversation with renowned curators in Asia and in Europe. They will reflect on the shifts in cultural practice brought about by the pandemic and share what they see as the future of culture. In our second webinar, we will interact with culture-related government institutions, both in Singapore and in Switzerland, to understand some of the mechanism and challenges that are involved in adapting the local and international programs. On behalf of the Swiss Embassy in Singapore, I want to thank you all for tuning in and I also want to extend a thank you to all of our speakers and our moderator, as well as to the ASF for our continued partnership. We wish you all the best for 2021, and we hope you will enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Greetings and Happy New Year from the Asia Europe Foundation. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar series, Culture in the Time of COVID. ASEF is delighted to partner with the Embassy of Switzerland, Singapore, to facilitate these timely conversations. In this time of great uncertainty for the arts, ASEF reaffirms its commitment to support meaningful exchanges where all sides are hard and new connections made. As we begin a new year, it is important to assess the learnings from 2020 and plan for the sustainability of the cultural sectors in Asia and Europe. I hope you can draw inspiration from the experiences of our distinguished speakers today. Do join us again on 28th January for the second webinar in this series. I'd also like to take this opportunity to extend our gratitude to the Swiss government and to Ambassador Fabrice Filier for their continued support and partnership. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this conversation on the shifts in cultural practice brought on by the pandemic. My name is Anupama Shekhar and I am the Director for Culture at the Asia Europe Foundation. Joining me today for the conversation are Diana campbell Bettencourt and Michael Schindhelm. Hello, Diana and Michael. Thank you so much for taking the time. Diana is a curator who has been working in South and Southeast Asia since 2010. She is the founding artistic director of the Dhaka-based Samdani Art Foundation and the chief curator of the Dhaka Art Summit, having led four critically acclaimed editions since 2014. Michael is a writer, filmmaker, curator, and advisor to leading international arts organizations. 
He has served as the CEO of several operas and theaters in Germany and Switzerland between 1992 and 2007. He is also the founding director of the Berlin Opera Foundation and the Dubai Culture and Arts Authority. Delighted to have both of them on board for this conversation today. I would like to begin by asking you, how has the cultural sector responded to the emergency situation that has been brought on by the pandemic? Some argue that the cultural sector has always been operating on a sort of an emergency mode because of chronic shortages in resources. Would you agree? Have we responded well to the crisis? Michael, could I turn to you for your thoughts first? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, um, first of all, I think uh, not uh, all cultural organizations suffer from shortages. Uh, we have probably to look at, at a global scale at the huge differences between uh, cultural organizations like uh, organizations like the Louvre in, in, in France, uh, or probably uh, the projects Diana is working on. So I think um, on the one hand, uh, from a Western perspective, we have to say, of course, we are still way better off than uh, many uh, arts institutions and artists in other parts of the world. However, of course, um, uh, also within our landscape, there are major differences between publicly funded organizations uh, and uh, self-trained uh, or, or uh, freelancing artists and creatives. Um, I think in general, the landscape in the Western world, and also I'm working currently also in, uh, in Hong Kong, for example, or in Saudi Arabia. And if you compare this, I, I must say there was almost everywhere an immediate and uh, pretty good response to the crisis and the pandemic uh, from art institutions. So they have uh, developed uh, compliance concepts, uh, which were uh, pretty good and uh, worked very well during the summer last year. However, when the second wave hit, they were among the first to be closed again down. And I think that shows also that uh, uh, politicians, uh, authorities may not consider art as necessary and uh, needed as other sectors uh, in our society. That's something we probably come back to later. But we still remember probably the videos and uh, photos we saw uh, 10 months ago or so in the beginning of the hard lockdown, uh, which circulated in social media where you saw artists performing uh, from balconies or even classical ballet dancers uh, performing in the streets uh, in front of their neighbors to show solidarity and solicit solidarity at the same time. I think these days are gone. We have to be clear about that. I think things have changed in the meantime. People are tired of it. And I think um, th th this hope uh, for a better, safer, and more beautiful future has transformed to some extent to an anxiety about um, what is uh, happening, uh, what is going to happen after the uh, pandemic is over, and what does that mean to the sector in general and to the artists as an individual? Uh, thank you, Michael. Diana, the floor is yours for your thoughts and ideas. Diana, you're on mute. I think that, Michael, that was very beautifully said. Um, looking at the context where I work, Bangladesh, like this country kind of exists on the back of disaster. Like if you look at its history, like it, it gained independence 50 years ago on the back of a devastating cyclone. Um, Bangladesh is one of the world's largest floodplains. And what I think is so interesting is also people name their daughter Flood. Bonna is a name. So actually flood has a different kind of meaning. People live with that. Um, so living with disaster is, I think, and living together as a community is how these people have have survived and thrived on in one of the most difficult geographic regions. And so imagine Bangladesh, 1971, independence, you know, back of flood, huge devastation, the Pakistani military butchered um, all of the intellectuals. Um, so they had to start a country from scratch. And one of the things they did was start the Bangladesh Shilpakala Academy, which is a, an institute institution for art and culture, it was one of the first things they started in 1973. So kind of, you know, Bangladesh got independence in December 71, it's kind of a year into the country. And this institution started Asia's first Biennale that still exists today. It's, it's no longer, you know, for our kind of art world, it's not really relevant. But in 1981, the Asian Art Biennale was groundbreaking. It had some of the most important artists in the region participating. 
And it wasn't because the governments weren't agreeing, the governments weren't interested, you know, Bangladesh had no money, it was new. It was because artists saw the importance of binding together and doing something. And I think that's also what we're seeing now, um, is that also there's a lot of socially engaged practices in Bangladesh. So artists like kind of or what I was seeing, you know, again, I haven't been in Bangladesh during the pandemic, um, but, um, you know, taking the energy that they would put into exhibition spaces and planning exhibitions and projects within their communities to kind of bring up the people around them, be it working with craftsmen and giving them other avenues for revenue, working with cinema banner painters, working with rickshaw painters. Um, I've liked seeing how the art sector has been supporting people who are artists, but maybe not within our art world. Um, and, um, yeah, it's something that I really love about Bangladesh. It's a very inclusive, um, I would say much more flat society than India is even. And um, things are open now, like Bangladesh is planning its next Asian Art Biennale. There's a photo festival, the Chobi Mela opening next month. And you're seeing all these collaborations kind of within the region. So Chobi Mela is collaborating with the Colombo Scope Festival in Sri Lanka. Um, we, the Samdani Foundation are collaborating with FICA, which is a patron led art institution in India to give cross-cultural grants. Um, yeah, it's kind of not taking, not getting flooded by disaster, but um, using it uh, as a catalyst. Thank you, uh, Diana. So, so I hear that there are demonstrations of solidarity, but also moments of anxiety because the, pan the crisis from the pandemic is now extending indefinitely. Uh, how do you see the solidarity uh, across regions and countries? You have already alluded a little bit to it, Diana, but what about between the global north and the global south, between the so-called developing and the developed world? What kind of uh, transnational connections exist there? And has the common challenge of facing this pandemic together somehow deepened the, the mutual understanding uh, between the different contexts and cultures uh, in the transnational art world? Uh, Diana, could I maybe turn to you first? Sure. Um, you know, I think we're still starting to see how this is playing out. Um, I, I can give you an example. Um, when I look at Bangladesh and solidarity and the global north, global south, the first humanitarian concert that ever happened was the 1971 um, George Harrison and Ravi Shankar concert for Bangladesh, right? So these musicians banded together, Madison Square Garden, uh, sold out uh, convert, uh, concerts, but at a time when the US was supplying weapons to Pakistan. This uh, concert is still raising money for Bangladesh via the George Harrison um, Trust at UNICEF. Um, we just received a grant from the British Council to revisit this concert, but with kind of the values of today where we can't really have Western rock stars speaking for a place they haven't been before. Um, you know, so honoring that, but the point is we weren't expecting this kind, it was 50,000 pounds. We weren't expecting this kind of money in this time of the pandemic, but it's kind of these pockets arise, but there's almost no time. Like there was a two week turnaround period to, to put this in. So I'm not sure, maybe Michael would know better than me, like what's the long-term planning for these things? Because for us, it's like, we collaborate with a lot of international institutions in Europe and in the US, but we're, we're not sure if that will continue. And in our kind of strategic planning, we're not assuming it will. Michael, your, your thoughts. Well, <clears throat> On the other, uh, on the one hand, I think indeed that um, it was quite striking to see that, uh, in, at least in quite a few governments, there was an awareness that culture is also part of our society and has to be uh, supported uh, during this crisis. So emergency funds were raised uh, and helped maybe artists at least uh, during the first wave in, in some of these countries. And however, I have to say one major problem is that most of this money is again assigned to institutions and non-institutionalized artists are of course way, way more in a precarious situation these days. And I think that will be, go on. And I'm a bit afraid that in the future we will have mostly the culture of employees, employed culture. And I think most of the creativity was so far rather uh, created among artists who are free freelancing artists, uh, independent artists. And in some way, I think this is one of the major concerns uh, for the time after the pandemic. How can we still strike a balance between uh, independent uh, artists and art institutions? The second thing is that man many of these emergency funds will probably uh, at some point be exhausted during already this year. 
And there are no real plans, I think, nowhere currently uh, where to go uh, after 2022. Everyone expects at least uh, further cuts. And I think for good reason, because if you look at the public debts, which have been now created almost everywhere uh, in, uh, say, um, the uh, uh, Western world, but I, I'm, uh, I know, of course, also in, in other parts of the world, I think that will be a very, very difficult task uh, for everyone uh, to cope with, and uh, there will be an enormous competition uh, the, uh, across the different sectors of the society uh, who gets the funds. Uh, is it healthcare? Is it education? Is it infrastructure? For example, uh, you know, the, the, the development of digitization, this is something everyone speaks about. So, uh, so there will be many other competitors uh, for uh, funds, and that's why I think um, there will be um, yeah, many issues uh, for the art scene to, um, to make evident how important uh, culture and arts are and that they have to be supported also in the future. It becomes, of course, even more severe if you look at the difference between uh, North and South. Um, I, if you just look at how currently uh, the um, distribution politics on the vaccine uh, is happening worldwide, right, with 95% of the vaccination happening in Western or in the developed countries, uh, not Western, but developed countries, um, so you imagine that uh, funds and resources will be again distributed in a non very just way that's what we have to face uh, for sure. However, I see also among artists a lot of solidarity I saw that uh, there were very, uh, I must say creative ways to um, overcome social distancing or actually just the fact that we were grounded and locked down and still found means, uh, artistic means to communicate with each other. I think that's a very important point uh, to make that, for example, I'm currently filming uh, in Hong Kong without having been there uh, for a single day so far because uh, I can't travel to Hong Kong, but we have to film in, in Hong Kong. So therefore, we are currently doing this uh, uh, on uh, live casts um, uh, with, with the software, which allows me to really navigate even the, 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 the operator, the camera person uh, on the ground there. So you see that, of course, um, there are a lot of technological possibilities today, but also I think, and that's maybe something we'll come back to later, I think there is a lot of creativity among artists and uh, uh, arts people in general, uh, also enthusiasts on how to overcome social distancing, how to socializing remoteness. I think there is a lot uh, going on. Uh, in terms of cultural practice, we know that it has dramatically changed. One uh, obvious thing is, is, you know, that we've all gone digital. Uh, but I'd like you to, to tell us a little bit more about how you see cultural practice changing, both in your own work and also in the communities that you work in, uh, especially uh, transnational artistic collaborations. And what are some of the adaptations that you see are going to be essential to survive in the, in the new normal? And how could we also leverage some of the current shifts, uh, some of which could also be perceived as negative shifts, uh, but how could they be leveraged for the benefit of the arts community in general? Uh, who should I turn to first? Diana, Michael? Michael, could I maybe, okay, the floor um, is already mind, yours. So. Uh, keep continuing. I think um, on the one hand, yes, technology provides a, a lot of new opportunities. I just mentioned this uh, film project. I'm working in Hong Kong. There's another project where I'm involved in, in, in the desert of Saudi Arabia, where uh, archaeologists are based in France, and they're actually doing archaeological survey from home. Uh, you know, there is, there is today, uh, there is their tools which allow uh, extraordinary things to do uh, without traveling. Globalization certainly has um, allowed us to travel massively over the last uh, two de decades. I, I mean, I'm coming from East Germany where there was no traveling whatsoever. I was uh, confined in a country with no whatsoever uh, possibilities of traveling. Uh, to other countries, and I found it amazing after 1990 when the war in, uh, between the communist and the capitalist world uh, fell, uh, what kind of opportunities you have when you are able to travel. But I think at some point we uh, that became also excessive to some extent, and I think 
uh, also in the art scene, there was a lot of traveling, which was really superficial and just for the sake of traveling and not necessarily for really making research or, or really creating, uh, creating substantial uh, work. So that's why I think um, this is also a moment of reconsideration. We probably need to rethink our uh, concept of uh, exchange and collaboration with people in other parts of the world. One of the things I can see now already is that um, we probably won't uh, totally cut off the connection we have created over the last uh, decades. But I think we probably need to select uh, more carefully what kind of connection we really want to have. So maybe the superficiality will be replaced by something more uh, loyal and uh, long lasting and enduring. Uh, and therefore maybe create also and foster longer and deeper relationships between artists. Um, there will be also, of course, uh, possibilities of, um, as I said already, remote uh, collaborations. I don't think that you need always to travel uh, to create, to collaborate, to create work together, to have your audiences also present. But still, I think um, there is, of course, a major issue and the, the, the pandemic has shown how fast borders can re can be re-established, right? Uh, how fast connections can be cut yeah. um, um, indefinitely sometimes. And I think uh, that should make us aware of how fragile uh, our social fabric globally really works. On the one hand, it was of course great to see that suddenly everywhere in the world felt we are at the same moment. We are in the moment where we have to face the same crisis. But at the same, and we may also share our experiences and uh, maybe innovation on how to overcome the crisis. But of course, on the other hand, we see that in particular, uh, the majority of many people want to have more borders again. There's no question about that. And how to deal with this in a world where artists don't consider themselves necessarily the first place national individuals anymore um, is something uh, we have to see and uh, we have to work out. Thank you, Michael. Diana. Great. Um, no, I completely agree with Michael. And maybe I'll address something on, on maybe another scale. Like when we think about the digital, not everyone has a smartphone, like it's, especially in Bangladesh, right? Like, you know, there's such a divide of inequality between who has a screen and who doesn't, who has high speed internet and who doesn't. And I'm very interested in how we reach people that the computer and the internet can't reach. Um, with the digital, some people and companies are making so much money off of this, while others have completely lost their livelihoods, right? We can think about garment factory workers in Bangladesh that, you know, the, all these orders are canceled, they haven't been paid, it's a disaster. Um, so I'm not interested in putting elite content for elite people out there in the world. Um, and I'm also worried about um, kind of a lack of appetite for risk, which Michael has also alluded to, right? Like if everything's going through the institutions and it has to be tested and you're, you're answerable to whether this is good or not, what happens to these kind of experimental practices or emerging practices that don't have that validation yet? Um, so I'm really interested in building new institutional structures to kind of support these holes in um, the system right now. Um, so connecting people with similar value systems to empower the kind of projects that probably wouldn't get funding otherwise. Um, and to reach people that we can't reach through digital means, but maybe artists on the ground can. Um, so working on a micro scale and building up. So one example of a project I'm involved with that um, works on this is, um, it's an umbrella of council, which is a Paris-based foundation. It's connected to the Caddis Foundation as well. Um, but they are commissioning artistic research to try to solve social problems. And um, so, for example, one of the inquiries that they placed was how do deaf people perceive sound? So, for example, there was no nothing in sign language to, ex to explain how deaf people perceive sound because sign language was made by hearing people for deaf people. But by working with artists and choreographers, scientists like doing um, lobster vibration research, they found that actually, you know, deaf people do perceive sound and they could make a language for it. Um, so there is this um, network that's part of council called a field and we give um, grants and fellowships to socially engaged practices across the world and we've just started inviting patrons in so collectors entrepreneurs who use their business skills to also help these artists who get the fellowships to further these initiatives so some of these projects are schools for refugees in greece or um, a program in bangladesh which is working with um 
indigenous textiles and um, vernacular art forms and trying to give it another life in the city. Um, so it's a way that kind of maybe us in, in our art world using computers can't reach the people that the artists with these social initiatives are, but by coming together, we can have a much wider reach than just supporting Tate or MoMA or these bigger institutions. Thank you uh, for that, Diana. This uh, sort of reminds me. Uh, Anubama, may, may I still yes, add? Yes, please. Uh, because uh, it just pops up in my mind. Uh, speaking about digitization, uh, digitalization, I think we, that's a, a subject we should um, discuss a little bit deeper here because, of course, everyone is speaking about this currently. And um, in many art, not only in many regions, um, there is this gap, but also in art disciplines. There are, uh, there are disciplines which uh, may also use uh, digital means, but at the same time, they really live from the life experience from the opposite of what you call social distancing. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is, of course, a, a particular threat to the future of those um, of those um, art institutions or practices in general. Uh, I'm speaking about theater, uh, mm -hmm. performing music, uh, uh, movie theaters in particular. And if you look at movie theaters, you can see really what's happening. Um, a, year from, uh, a year ago or two years ago, there were a few digital platforms uh, 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 sort of streaming uh, services like uh, Netflix uh, or Amazon. In the meantime, these things are mushrooming, but on a very high level and uh, on a very big scale, competing uh, over market shares. Uh, they may actually pretty soon overwhelm uh, also even national broadcasters, even public broadcasters in, in many countries and become the most present uh, uh, services of uh, streaming uh, products uh, like films, uh, but news, etc. Uh, and they are created somewhere far away by an anonymous organization, uh, which is uh, a, a private uh, enterprise. And you wonder, of course, um, as a filmmaker, for example, but I think in general as, as someone who is creative, uh, where are you going to put your stuff in the future? And do you need actually to comply uh, with the gatekeeping uh, uh, procedures of Netflix if you want to show a film? Um, that's one of the things I, I think uh, we, we have to be aware of that. Um, there is currently a lack of strategic thinking on how to cope or to respond uh, to the te technological change uh, we are facing currently and which has been accelerated by, by the pandemic. Uh, I do think that uh, one of the major problems is that uh, governments cannot put out currently uh, not resources for, for uh, strategic development. And I think uh, what we would need is not necessarily respond for the next three months only, mm -hmm. but a response for what is happening after 2030, uh, 2023. Uh, and uh, in particular, how do we in, in the sphere of culture and arts mm -hmm. do respond uh, to technological changes, which cannot be uh, fixed overnight, but will sooner or later probably very much, uh, very much define our landscape and the way how we practice. Thank you for that, Michael. Both of you alluded uh, to these issues of underrepresentation or being disadvantaged or stereotyped. And in, in the current context, you, you've, you've shared some examples of how things are in some cases improving, but others not. Uh, I'd like us to look at this issue of underrepresentation or, or kind of slipping through the cracks in this current digital climate, uh, also from the point of view of regions and countries. Uh, we've always had, uh, particularly in the context of Asia Europe, which is the context in which uh, we at the Asia Europe Foundation work, there are always countries or regions that are overrepresented or are better known or have better access and others which struggle for that access and visibility. How is that changing? Has the pandemic and the uh, online or going digital, has that helped somehow offset the, the old imbalances in representation or has have, have new problems cropped up. So if, if you could share your thoughts from the point of view of countries and regions and how you see uh, the next year or two panning out, what would be your thoughts? Diana, could I maybe turn to you first? I would say for the next one or two years in terms of Bangladesh and South Asia, I'm not so worried because actually that research was done before. I'm more worried about the two to five year 
uh, range. So right, we our summit ended February 15th. We had 500,000 visitors in nine days. We had representatives from most major museums. We even have a whole Dhaka Art Summit exhibition that's opened in a museum in Thailand right now. So we have we have a work from Dhaka Art Summit 2018 showing in Singapore this weekend. So it's um, for me, it's it's more of a concern about the future mm -hmm. and how will you know, Biennale models are going to change. Um, I spoke to a colleague at MoMA, unless you're a chief curator, you can't propose any exhibition until the end of 2022. Um, so I, I think we don't know what that answer is right now. I, I am moved, like we get lots of inquiries of curators wanting to reach out and connect with Bangladeshi artists. And we've helped them kind of create digital studio visits where we coach them, we edit them. So I think the access to the material is there. The question is, what's the outlet for it to be shown? Thank you, Diana. Michael? Uh, if you allow me to uh, look again first at the big picture, um, I think, um, of course, if you speak about Asia, Europe, then we speak about Asia, I'm, I'm sorry to say in the first place about Asia, China. That's probably for many people, the major concern, at least in this part of the world, probably not so much in China, but definitely here. And that has a lot to do on the one hand, of course, with all the debates about how this pandemic came all about, uh, and also how it was responded in China and uh, how, of course, in general, uh, the um, society, but also uh, the economy of our countries has res have responded uh, to the pandemic. And you can see now already that China is growing again uh and uh, obviously uh, seems to have shrugged off uh, shrugged off the 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 consequences to some extent at least uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, pandemic because of a very uh harsh lockdown and response to it in the in the beginning um but at the same time you see certainly that uh, this kind of power balance uh, which is sort of on the mind of many people between this uh, new rising uh, giant uh, economically, but also in terms of creativity, China on the one hand, yeah, and, and the, the old world, Europe on the other, that is something which is on the mind of many people. We have many Chinese people in our countries. You probably see that in the United States, for example, anti-Chinese, anti-Asian sentiment uh, has grown over the last uh, year. There's a, there's a major dis debate even going up to places like Hollywood, where, where you see that uh, there's a major debate in the country about how to uh, cope with new racial tensions. And I think that's something we have to face in Europe too. Uh, so in other words, uh, I think, um, again, we are rather experiencing the rise of borders, maybe also the reconstruction of, of borders, maybe also of cultural and racial borders. And uh, that may also uh, be the case between Asia and Europe to some extent. And, uh, you know, when people are doing well, they are, of course, usually more tolerant. The moment, uh, you know, they, they uh, slip into a crisis uh, and a, a fight for survival starts, solidarity is often uh, really the first thing to go. And that's why my concern is again, how uh, we can actually recreate this kind of open uh, mindedness of uh, many people in many parts uh, of uh, the world towards the other. I think that is something which is very much at stake currently. I was working over the last years uh, in European cities and I saw that there is a certain growing tiredness among uh, a share of the population and not necessarily only old people and uneducated people um, who um, think that they have enough of multiculturalism, of cultural exchange. And I think that is one of the major signs for that something is not quite right in the society anymore. Yeah? There is obviously a lack of openness. Uh, there is there's uh, something stuck, um, and uh, nationalism is uh, growing again, etc. And I think you uh, see this unfortunately also in the way how resources are distributed. You shouldn't forget that the main funder of uh, most art projects uh, are in many countries still public institutions of nations or cities in nations. Mm -hmm. And I can see right now already when you want to do a multinational project, it's becoming more and more difficult because um, many of uh, the funders would ask first what we get from as a nation. Yeah. For example, if you make a film uh, where 
you you deal with uh, I'm, I'm currently preparing a film about the pandemic actually about the creation of the vaccination and of course that is nothing uh, about a nation but you need to get the funds from uh, national broadcasters or national film foundations they would first ask but you have to cover us then our country otherwise it is nothing we can really uh, justify towards uh, the people who actually give us the money and that's something uh, I, I think will become very difficult to, to uh, cope with in the future if this kind of national thinking or nationalist thinking is growing again. Um, because I think before the crisis, we had achieved uh, an extraordinary exchange between Asia and Europe. And there was also among people who are not necessarily experts, quite some knowledge about also smaller countries, mm -hmm. cities which were not always uh, the first class tourist destinations. You saw that there was really a growing interest also from both ends. I was, for example, working often with people from Indonesia, and you saw that they had already traveled uh, to many places, also smaller places in Europe, and uh, vice versa. So in other words, there, there was actually a great uh, status of exchange and uh, knowledge, shared knowledge, joint knowledge. And uh, how to preserve this and develop this further is probably one of the major tasks. And um, here again, I think art institutions should play a certain role because institutions usually don't operate national only. They have many of their, for example, artists in, in a theater, for example, you have artists coming from 20, 30, 40 uh, 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 countries, and the same is in museums, etc. And that's why there is already this kind of understanding of multiculturalism and uh, exchange between cultures. And that to promote, I think, should be one of the, the major tasks, uh, admissions for cultural institutions worldwide in the, near, in the, in the next years. Uh, thank you uh, for, for that, uh, Michael. This you, You've alluded to, to the issues of, of nationalism, and I'm going to look at it from the other side and say what role also for foundations, including uh, like ourselves and other funders of the arts who are working multilaterally and whose uh, core aim is to promote multilateral connections, which could in some ways respond to some of the concerns that you have raised. Would you have some thoughts about or what would you advise uh, funders, especially those working multilaterally, what kind of programs and policies would you envisage for the next, uh, let's say, three to five years, once the emergency funding sort of dies off or existing projects taper off? Uh, what could be uh, the things that you could recommend? We see increasingly a lot of uh, projects are being adapted. There are a lot more grants available now to work digitally, to collaborate digitally, but is that enough? if we're not going to be able to travel as freely as, as we could for the next, let's say, three to five years, uh, what could be other formats, modalities to support arts organizations and to support collaborations? And there is the other question of several small to medium-sized arts organizations really facing the risk of shutting down. Uh, how do we respond to that? Because we, we do see some funders now offering emergency funding for three to six months to a year, but what happens after that? It's an it's a issue that Diana has raised as well. So any advice, recommendations, thoughts, uh, when you look at funders who are operating not just nationally, but who, whose mandate is to support multilateral or international cooperation projects? Diana? I've been very interested in, you know, it's not only now, but, you know, how, you know, there's all this talk about artist collectives, right? So collectives are kind of, a, you know, they've existed for a long time, but there's a, there's a focus on them now. But what about collectives of patrons, right? That also kind of removes that ego bit or takes it out a, a bit further. So um, there's a, I mentioned, I alluded to this foundation already, FICA, the Foundation for Indian Contemporary Art in India. Their mandate is that they can only support Indian artists. But they wanted to do something transnationally. So we created a grant together called Stitching Screens, where we're supporting a pair of, of a Bangladeshi artist and an Indian artist to collaborate digitally to make a work that can circulate um, without shipping or travel. Um, and we're also going to create a publication about this project with um, about 20 artists, so 10 from India, 10 from Bangladesh. The point is it was looking at the mandate of the Indian Foundation, looking at our mandate of the Bangladeshi Foundation, and finding a way that while following our rules, we could create channels of communication that weren't there before. 
Um, and in Hong Kong, I'm super impressed with the work that Parasite is doing in the sense of these paid studio visits so that they're providing streams of income for artists that don't have it, also giving health insurance or this kind of um, you know, grants of funding for residencies without traveling. So how do you support artists to not be stuck, especially the ones that are not getting shows or um, opportunities right now? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a much smaller scale than Michael is. I'm curious to see what he's seeing, seeing in a more bigger picture. But I think um, it's, for, on my side, it's encouraging patrons to support you know, emerging practices through networks that are connecting contexts um, that, you know, might not happen otherwise. Michael? Hmm. Well, uh, on the, uh, I think the pandemic uh, made us lonelier than we were before, right? Um, and it is, a, the pandemic is a phenomenon of uh, isolation. And also, I think that the art could, as a result of the pandemic, uh, become more isolated from the rest of the society mm -hmm. if we are not carefully counterbalancing this. As I said already, there will be a lot of competition over also awareness of where to help, yeah, where things are going particularly bad. And I think uh, only soliciting more resources is probably not the right concept uh, to respond to this. I think um, foundations like your one uh, should probably focus also on projects um, where you clearly see that this is the endeavor is to overcome the isolation, to make connection to the rest of the society. I think for most artists that is still the vast majority of us, that's still the thing they want to achieve, connecting to the society. You're not creating only for yourself and hopefully not only for your gatekeepers who allows you to have a show somewhere or to print a book, uh, but you have an audience, you have a community you want to address. And that community is not necessarily only composed of experts, but of people who have maybe otherwise different professions, walks of lives, et cetera. So they are representing the society. So projects um, uh, where you see that people try to overcome this growing isolation, um, I think is very important. And you should probably think of uh, not only looking at the artists as they are today already, but uh, also at the, uh, the, the, the artists to come because what I can see from my experience in uh, various arts, uh, universities and schools is that we are still producing every year uh, thousands and 10,000s of new artists who are great uh, talents, there's no question. But what kind of future they are facing? What, what, what kind of landscape will actually receive them and allow them to work and uh, maybe also make a living with what they have studied? So there's a, there's a major question of uh, how many art is actually really feasible to, to fund, uh, to, to make sustainable. And again, I think um, projects which show that art is not only for art. Uh, there, there's a French word, uh, the term uh, l'art pour l'art, yeah? mm -hmm. which means this is only art for the artists. Yeah? And that's unfortunately something what many people think that art is only for the artists. Mm -hmm. If you look at lit, a little bit uh, at a broader context, I think this is a great opportunity to show that this is not true. That art is actually not only for artists. In the first place, it is for the people. Uh, in the first place, art has now an opportunity to show the relevance for societal evolution and maybe also creating uh, new harmony and, uh, and, and a future for, for many people. And what I can see already is that uh, community building is probably a great opportunity for, for artists uh, to show if they have this talent or not. I was told by a, a Hong Kong uh, artist a few days ago, uh, who himself is a painter and sculptor, uh, he said, uh, you know, at, at school I actually learned a language and I can apply this language to sculpture and painting, but I can apply it also to community uh, um, work. For example, He's opening now uh, um, a street kitchen. He's helping people uh, in Kowloon and Hong Kong uh, to reorganize public space, uh, to create neighborhoods uh, where there is something happening, uh, which is maybe a mix of uh, social work and uh, community and art and culture. 
Yeah, and uh, I think that's uh, in particular in a city like Hong Kong, uh, like Hong Kong, extraordinarily important to reopen the public space because the public space is actually where the things are happening between the people, and where artists could be the instigators for a new conversation and communication between the people. Projects of that kind could be interesting, and many artists may discover that they're actually not doing their work anymore as they uh, were used to uh, learn it and uh, to do it before. They have to also change their practice. They have to adapt their practice to a society which has changed. And I think um, we may actually discover that many artists are also great artists when not doing art, but maybe do other work. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to a final point, uh, which um, in, in this context, which uh, might be important for your organization and for many organizations, that's the, que the question of reskilling. Mm -hmm. I do think that Reskilling doesn't necessarily mean only that you have to give up on what you have learned before, but you rather have to build on what you already uh, have achieved in order to achieve even more. And I think um, reskilling is something uh, which has been um, named as an important um, goal of uh, personal development and, and professional development uh, by many organizations, for example, like the World Economic Forum. Um, um, due to the so-called uh, new uh, industrial revolution, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. I think uh, the pandemic shows that that revolution is even more revolutionary than we expected. And we have to even be faster in doing these things and allowing people to learn more and other things that they have learned at the university to being able uh, to cope with this. Uh, a new change. And I think that's uh, true to artists too. And arts organizations um, should really address this and should also introduce opportunities of creating reskilling projects where people on the one hand use their tools and skills, uh, uh, but in order to uh, actually make the change which is necessary currently uh, for creating a future after the pandemic. Michael, I appreciate this advice um, you're, you're giving, but I'm not sure if you're aware, like the Duck Art Summit is the highest daily visited art exhibition in the world. We had like, you know, statistically. Congratulations. Um, I'm glad we, to hear. No, I didn't know. Yeah, so we've achieved what you've talked about before the pandemic hit. We also show socially engaged practices, bringing together collectives who build systems outside of art from Africa, from countries that aren't getting visas to Bangladesh. The government gave us those visas mm -hmm. and we found ways to do this. So in a way, like we've achieved what you um, or you know what you described was possible right before COVID hit, mm -hmm. and so, so for, um, for you, that for you, I think it should be important to show also that you are then a role model for what needs to happen also elsewhere. Because I have to say, in my practice, unfortunately, many haven't learned this lesson yet, and I think it is in particular the more traditional arts and arts institutions. Who are often still stuck in the in the mold of a routine they were used to and it was never questioned because for example a classical concert or even a movie theater people would go and watch a movie there these things may not happen the same way anymore so how can you actually survive uh, as a filmmaker or as a, a ballet dancer uh, just or as a writer without bookshops uh, uh, anymore everything distributed by amazon uh, who takes also the major share of this uh, so how do you survive in such a changing uh, uh, landscape and I think uh, visual arts are in particular often more innovative in responding to changes. They were also probably faster in coping with globalization, crossing borders, creating new forms like platforms, bi 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 biennials are actually good examples for that. And I think uh, you may actually play an important role in disseminating this knowledge and showing that these changes are possible to disciplines where these things are due to happen. We're working on it. So it was like before we knew the seriousness of the pandemic, our last Friday, we had 111,000 people in one day that we realized then that we could not do another exhibition like this because it was not safe for the artworks. Um, so in, and now we're trying to work on, you know, so I'm glad you said this, an interdisciplinary festival where we're supporting theater, dance, culinary arts, literature, um, music in the same way we have with the visual arts. But 
we haven't figured out how to do this yet because um, the whole crowd control, social distancing, what's the arch yeah. what's the architecture of a show that's safe? Like Bangladesh is fully open right now, as is India, but I think it's going to hit another wave the same way we're, feel we're feeling in Europe right now. I'm so, very impressed. I will probably uh, check out what you're doing and uh, follow this uh, because uh, it's of course very interesting and encouraging to hear. Yeah, but lots to do. So it's, you know, I think right now for us, it's these short term like injections to keep people working before the big show happens again in right. two years, three years, whenever it can. Right. Sure. Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to pick up on a point that, you know, we've been speaking about socially engaged artistic practices. And we have uh, a question from, from an audience uh, member uh, today. Uh, artist Sunhi Kim uh, is asking, do we somehow as artists always have to prove that artistic practice has some level of social or community value uh, in order to secure funding? This is an age old uh, question. Uh, and might this create yet another kind of, of imbalance? What are your thoughts? Ben? Well, just uh, briefly, Michael. sorry, uh, uh, just briefly, um, Yes and no. I think it depends uh, in which context you work. Uh, there are uh, contexts where it is not really asked uh, all the time, you know, and there are others where you are asked all the time to pr prove this. And I think currently, yes, uh, I think that's a, it's a major thing because uh, you show that you are relevant. If you want to be relevant, you need to stick out, you, you need to get out of your house uh, to some extent and show your face and show that you are part of this transformation and you are able to respond in a way which makes sense. Of course, you need to retreat as an artist too and uh, be able to create. And that's why you cannot be all the time in the streets. You cannot be all the time on public space, but there are times where that is really important. I think we are living in such a time. Or also it can be the role of the institution to mediate your work so that it can connect socially, right? I don't think it's the, you know, the role of the artist is that that's not your role, but it's or not the only role. So I think it's collaborating across multiple layers to give the artist the most potential to be creative and um, give the public the best chance to connect with that. Uh, Michael, you were speaking earlier about uh, the fact that with this rising nationalism, the closing of borders, and perhaps also some anti-Asian sentiment in parts of the world, we seem to have uh, taken five steps back in the, in the progress we have made in connecting Asia and Europe in, in the last two decades. Um, in my opinion, one of the challenges uh, is that there is often not enough funding uh, to, to build long-term networks. Uh, funders are often interested in exhibitions and things that are public facing, uh, the so-called spectacle sometimes. Uh, but is there a resistance or is there enough funding uh, for building networks between independent arts communities in Asia and Europe, which could also on the ground change these views about that we have about uh, the other? Uh, and especially now when we are not able to travel, uh, how is that impacting networks? and? Is there uh, a need to, to spend more or for funders to, to actually fund these kinds of networks, even when they may not be able to, to produce the kind of grand outputs uh, that are often required to secure uh, funding? Any thoughts on this? Diana, maybe I, I could turn to, to you for some thoughts. Um, I think things are are just, you know, it's like people, like Michael was saying, at the beginning there was this solidarity, then people got a bit fed up, and now I think the, the ground is starting to settle and people are trying to plan things out. Um, I have been getting inquiries about kind of these international government-funded networks for art education, because everyone is seeing that art education is important. So, you know, it, how, do, how do you get works and ideas from museums into schools? How do you get things from the art institution into society? And there's a fantastic idea um, coming out of Italy, um, looking at, um, you know, why, let's say if there's a big Bangladeshi community in Naples, why aren't art educators there looking at how um, educators in Bangladesh are dealing with those communities and bringing them into the Italian museum? Um, and so it's not just about Bangladesh, Italy, it's about the kind of a global platform, but there's government support for this and it's trying to build larger. So, you know, I'm encouraged by some of these things, but I don't know what that means on a bigger picture yet. These could just be isolated examples. 
Uh, I'm going to turn once again to some uh, questions that are coming in from our audience. And this is about the, the big question about uh, funding the arts. Who will or should fund the arts? And uh, we have uh, Abdul Dube, who's a freelance uh, graphic designer and uh, cultural practitioner, uh, suggests that the philanthropic uh, community, that philanthropy should actively support the arts and should at this moment have some deep introspection about funding the arts. Uh, we're sort of running out of time, so I'm going to turn to you with this last question about, in your context, who has been funding the arts? And, and given the current situation and the way forward, uh, what are your thoughts on who should or will fund the arts? Michael, maybe I could, I could turn to you first. Everyone should fund the arts. Uh, in particular artists themselves, uh, who sometimes are also high net worth um, in individuals, by the way. Um, but uh, to be uh, give a serious answer, I think there will be always a public-private partnership necessary, and that has to be re renegotiated after the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, we see, of course, that many people lost money, uh, but we see also that uh, in the United States alone, uh, during 2020, uh, around 500 people made a billion dollars in revenue in in in, in new uh, income, uh, and so we see that uh, the richer became the rich people came became mostly even richer at least the major part of them. So there is a there is a kind of uh, critical shift happening from the public to the private because at the same time the public sector suffers from the public debt. So therefore there will be probably a responsibility on the public on the private sector in the future even more than before. I would also like to quickly um, say that um, yes that's true that there, there was always uh, the hype around spectacles funding rather you know things which were attracted or uh, attractive already before they were actually funded. That's uh, pretty true but at the same time uh, we feel that there is already a change and there was a change happening already, starting already to happen before the pandemic, which uh, rather aims at uh, sustainability. And I think sustainability is, is a very important uh, matter in this regard. I think uh, we have to justify that the things we're doing are not just fireworks. They really have some kind of impact on what we're doing. Not necessarily always for the social fabric, but maybe at least for the art world itself too, for the discourse, et cetera. Sustainability, I think it's a, it's a very important thing. And uh, let me just finish with one um, thing I, I mentioned also in, in another context recently. We speak often about contemporary art. So we, we consider us uh, being contemporaries. Uh, we don't speak about contemporary politics, contemporary sports, contemporary education. So we seem to have a particular sense for time and for present time in particular. I think that's a very interesting thing uh, that artists claim uh, to have a particular uh, relationship to the present time. And I think uh, the pandemic forced us even uh, to create a new notion of time, right? Things became faster and faster before 2020. And it was uh, the, the present time was only the terminal to the future. Uh, so and we were also talking all the time about the future. Uh, I, I think it's great to have uh, initiatives like Fridays uh, for Future, but I think we should also have Fridays and maybe not only Fridays for the present time. And that's what we, uh, I think if we don't really organize and create a kind of uh, livable present time, we won't create an interesting and important future either. And I think uh, art is something which catches the moment. And we had a lot of dark moments during, during this pandemic. Yeah? And I think we may have even more dark moments after the pandemic due to the consequences of the pandemic. And the contemporary art, if it's really contemporary, should be able to make, the, make another feel and uh, say, create another notion of what is the present time, creating contemporariness making us really connect among uh, our communities as contemporaries. I think that's something uh, which I find could be an interesting criteria also for funding art projects. Yeah, contemporariness, showing that we are contemporaries. 
Michael, that was really, really beautiful and, and kind of vibing off of that, that idea of contemporaries and funding and also artists sometimes being funders. I was really um, moved to discover that the founder of Kickstarter is an artist. Um, his name is Perry Chen and he's based in Paris. And it was interesting. So Kickstarter is kind of invented this digital crowdfunding model where let's say Michael had a film that he wanted to make and he didn't, he you know wasn't known enough to go get the big government funding. Maybe he had a hundred classmates that would each give you know a little bit of money uh, in advance and then you would have the money to make the film. Um, and so this artist, when he was in college, wanted to make a music festival, couldn't afford the fees of the concert, but realized if all of his friends kind of contributed in advance, they could do this. But I love that idea because it's contemporaries coming together to support something that some, like, a, you know, one of these 500 billionaires that, that Michael mentioned, maybe wouldn't see yet, right? And also there's that saying that, you know, the con something contemporary is dark because the light hasn't hit it yet, right? When something's illuminated, it's the light from the past. So how can we support each other rather than waiting for the big check? You know, how do we, um, yeah, be contemporaries and support things of different scales? Yeah, but thank you for that. It's, uh, we, we return to a, to a different form of solidarity uh, through through this contemporariness. Uh, we are almost out of time. So thank you so much for this conversation. You have, I think, given us uh, a few interesting ideas for the reset that is perhaps definitely going to be necessary uh, for art making and for the cultural uh, sector. A uh, couple of interesting ideas that you have left us with are perhaps it's time for new institutional structures, as Diana said, a collective of, of patrons, not just of, of artists. Uh, while not diminishing the value of face-to-face -face encounters in cultural exchange, we've also sort of rethought mobility. Perhaps slow mobility is a good thing after all to, to make deeper uh, long-standing alliances. Uh, and I like Michael's uh, use of the word loyalty. There are more loyal connections than uh, the, the usual uh, fast mobility that we were getting used to of, of being in, in three cities in a week uh, without exploring uh, things deep enough. Um, it was interesting also uh, that Michael raised the issue of supply and demand. Uh, how many artists are we creating and how many uh, are we able to accommodate with uh, in terms of, of supporting them? Um, and therefore the issues of looking towards the future and looking also at this notion of, of reskilling that you uh, brought up, Michael. And the idea of who will fund uh, the arts. We've, we've been hearing a lot of debates now about artists having perhaps more opportunities to showcase themselves, uh, but not necessarily being paid for it. Or if works are being commissioned, often uh, that commissioning includes handing over the copyrights to to a to a funder or third party. So in that sense, it was uh, interesting to hear that perhaps all of us should you know fund the arts, should pay uh, for the art that we consume and uh, to also actively look at public-private partnerships uh, as a way to, to build a sustainability in the arts uh, going forward. Thank you so much for your time, Michael and uh, Diana. Thanks everyone for joining this conversation and do join us again next week, uh, uh, Thursday the 28th of January for a second and final conversation where we will be talking to representatives from public agencies working in culture and how they responded to the crisis and changed their policies or programs to support the arts. Thanks everyone and until next week, stay safe. I think the live feed is has been cut as we can see that. You were mute. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for taking the time so early in the morning.